Right, what we're going to look at today is how we successfully manage health and safety on a brute like we've got here. Uh, it's a major construction project in anybody's terminology, uh, but the, one of the main parts of it obviously is keeping the university fully operational while we're doing this. And it can be a very tricky balance at the best of times. Sorry, has anybody got any questions about CDM before we start? Oh, thank God for that. If you have, you're very sad. Right, CDM is a very simple set of regulations, or should be. Okay, it's all straight lines, everybody knows exactly what they're doing. There's no conflict at all. We start off simply by having a client for the project. <coughs> Excuse me. In this example, it's actually Oxford Brooks University, are the client. Uh, we then have under CDM a thing called a CDM coordinator, who coordinates health and safety, oddly enough. And that, in this case, is a capital projects team. And then, of course, we have the design team, which I think you've probably met most of those. And then Lango Rourke and the various contractors that work underneath them. And structured around that are the three main pieces of paper we have to produce. The first one is a pre-construction information pack, which is prepared by the CDM coordinator at the outset of the project and it keeps developing and to actually let the contract. The idea being to provide information that designers need in order to design uh, appropriately for where we are, for what we want. It provides information for the principal contractor. Things like power supplies, gas and all that sort of idea goes into there. And then that's disseminated down from the principal contractor to his contractors. So the ground workers would need, for example, the services section of this pre-construction information pack. Uh, the other two bits of paper, think called a health and safety plan. We require the principal contractor to make a plan on how he's going to manage health and safety through the project, which he did quite well. It's about that thick. And then finally, we need a thing called a health and safety file. And this records health and safety information that informs future construction work. So in the future, when you come to either clean your windows in the new building or if I'm going to do any construction work on it at all, then that's where we go to find out any health and safety information. Okay, is that clear enough? Yeah, any questions about that bit? Oh, In reality, that's what it looks like. This is CDM as applied to this project. Okay? We've still got a client, Oxford Brooks University. We still have Capital Projects Department as the CDM coordinator. Uh, of course, we've got in the client body all the various departments, all the various faculties, their wants and needs. We have Tim over there on the right, OBU Safety Department, it's my right if I stand that way. And then me underneath Tim and all that lot design team, Lango wrote the contractor. And you'll see on this diagram, everything is two-way. It's information to and from. So for example, Tim uh, liaises with the various departments and faculties and then passes information to me or back to the client or to capital projects. Whoever needs to actually know the information that is found. Similarly, we can feed back to Tim from Lango Rock via Capital Projects, for example, on any issues they have that require university resolution as opposed to me. I'm simply a safety advisor, that's all I do. Okay, so you can see it's not quite as easy as the law actually wants it to be, unfortunately. But then it's an operational university. We need to keep this place working, as it were. Okay, any questions about that? That's more like the reality of things as they, they occur. Right, the CDM coordinator mentioned that a couple of times. <coughs> One of my principal roles is assist the capital projects team in discharging the duties of the CDM coordinator. So it's probably worth just popping through these in terms of what they are. I can see you all making notes. Is there any way we can just do a copy of this and distribute it? Oh, yeah, okay. So you don't have to write everything down. Okay. Uh, so CDM coordinator's duties, fairly f uh, straightforward. They're split between me and the capital projects team. So the first one there, advise the client. This is on matters health and safety, obviously. So we advise them when they can and can't do things. Uh, any specific advice on how you do a thing, for example, that kind of idea. Um, both myself and Capital Projects team do that. So any advice the client needs on sizes of things, all that sort of idea, accesses, fire escape routes, so on and so forth, is fed back to them from the two of us. Notifying the project, the simplest job. You fill out a form and send it to HSE. I'll explain HSE a bit later. 
Uh, so we send it off. Design coordination. Okay, seems unfair, really. We employ all these fabulous professionals, and you've met most of them in the team, as it were. But you still have somebody like me coordinating the design. But it's in terms of health and safety, making sure things fit together as they should do. Also, sequencing as well. So the designer may wish something built in a particular order, but there may be a health and safety consideration we have to make that changes the order it's done. On this particular thing we've got at the moment, as you can understand, it's all phased. So we've got an atrium building, the Abercrombie being refurbished, and we're still waiting for the NLTB, the new library and teaching block. And now obviously in the final thing, then all of the fire uh, alarm systems, for example, are all connected. But at the moment, we have a fire alarm system in the atrium that didn't actually go anywhere. So we had to bolt that onto the old one to make it so it does work. Okay, Coordinating the design. It isn't just, oh, I don't like pink or blue or whatever. It's actually checking to make sure it works all the way through. So the interim stage, uh, while we, when we've got the new atrium, and before we then LTB, there's quite a few interfaces there to spot and correct, as it were. Fire escape routes is one of our biggest problems on this. Where in the final version, obviously the fire escape routes comply, they do all they're supposed to do. But at the moment, I've got a finished atrium with some lovely fire escape routes, but there's nowhere to go from them. So we have to resolve that one. So this is design coordination, okay, making sure everything fits together. Uh, obviously the pre-construction information, I've mentioned that fairly quickly. Again, that's a combination of myself and capital projects. So if we need surveys undertaken, we need information buying in, capital projects pay for it, not me. I just advise capital projects, it would be very useful to have that sort of survey or this sort of survey to provide information to people. Obviously a lot of information comes from the university and Tim provides that. So the pre-construction uh, pre information pack is made up of a lot of inputs. Uh, flow of information, oddly enough. Um, both of us really, but a couple of projects and myself, manage the flow of information between everybody. Mine is specifically health and safety, but information about sort of contractual changes or changes of detail, that sort of idea, they're mainly through a couple of projects. If it's a change or information is required for a health and safety aspect of it, then of course it comes through us to make sure that we make it gets to the right people at the right time. Construction phase plan. <laughs> this is prepared by Lane O'Rourke on this job. I mean, the principal contractor is a proper term. And the, the CDM coordinator's job is to make sure it's adequate. It's suitable and sufficient for this job. And oddly enough, they gave that to me to look at. And it took about three weeks to work my way through it. But you have to read everything that you're given, particularly on health and safety. You don't just scan it or read the contents page or the exact summary. You have to go through the whole lot. I'll show you why in a bit. And then finally, there's this thing called health and safety file. Uh, CDM coordinated job, certainly. Uh, it's a couple of projects team are dealing with that exclusively. And it's going on a thing called eDocs. So a very specific structure of a document. And that's the way the university want it. That's the way the university are getting it. Capital projects manage it. Okay, any questions about the CDM coordinator's job? Oh, right, that's my appointment. I'm appointed as a construction health and safety advisor to the capital projects team. So I provide them with all the advice they need on whatever they want it to do. Uh, in terms of contract, it's a framework agreement. It's a rolling thing. And I've been on this since November 2008, only because I haven't found the escape door yet. But I'll keep trying. Okay, what that is. Uh, that's what it says in my contract. If you really want to read that, wait until you get the electronic version. Okay, it's my responsibility to monitor and sort of look after everybody and his mate, make sure everything fits together, nobody gets offended by anything. Uh, make sure everything's to a satisfactory standard, uh, particularly statutory requirements are uh, part of my duties, making sure it complies with statute. Uh, pretty much everything apart from making the tea. Right, if you know nothing else about health and safety, know this. Okay, the, uh, I would say the vast majority of health and safety legislation comes with this phrase attached to it, so far as reasonably practicable. Okay. Believe me, experts spend months talking about this and then they realise they don't actually really understand it. 
according to the, the definition laid down in 1956, was it? Thereabouts. Edwards versus Sorry? Edwards versus the National Coal Board. Yeah, see, that's a proper safety man. He knows that sort of stuff. Right. Uh, basically, the fire is reasonably practical. It's a balance. It's all it is. A seesaw, if you like. We put the risk of injury or the risk to health on one side of the seesaw. And on the other side, we put the cost of doing something about it. And generally, we can't let them outweigh each other. Okay, so if there's a risk of death, then obviously we've got to spend a lot of cost to actually get rid of the risk. If the risk is a slight bruising on the finger, then the cost relates to that as well. Always in balance. Now, cost, oddly enough, is not simply money. It also involves the time taken to do something about this risk. The trouble you have to go through to actually get rid of it. Money, obviously a fairly big one. Aesthetics is a cost we can weigh in. But it shouldn't be <laughs> sort of the only cost we put on that balance. It's very difficult to defend if you do that. And then project constraints. Obviously we all have sort of limited money, we have limited time to do things, limited scope. So we have to consider all those things in terms of getting rid of the risk. Okay. Of course, the higher the risk, the higher the cost. There's no defence against that. Any questions about that? If you want to write anything down, write that down. Yes, sir. How do you decide how much something's worth? Say again? How do you decide how much something's worth? Like a life or a month? Well, in my life, it's billions. <laughs> Obvious. <laughs> uh, no, you don't make that sort of decision. That decision is made for you in the court. There you go. Was the cost reasonable? Well, uh, oh, you want to tell me. Very simple. Okay. So no, cost is a, it's one you've got to estimate, you've got to work out. Okay, there are no situations where it's okay to kill anybody. It wasn't my first career, but not now. Uh, I can't allow a high risk of injury just for a pretty thing on a building. Okay, so it's got to be balanced, everything carefully thought out. And the whole of the design is due to under CDM, come with that attached to it. Okay. Are we happy? Right. Just to go through the few, the few of the things we've actually come across on our way through. Uh, on these, Tim and I have worked on them together every step of the way. First one, a very good, a very good uh, example of how all sorts of different things come into play on a project. Now, on this project, we want to bring excellent. <laughs> Cracking, absolutely brilliant. And as part of that, we have natural, natural ventilation has been the way of ventilating the building. Okay? With me on that one so far? Yep, good. On. Right, so what that means is to ventilate our building, when I say the atrium, for example, then we must have a large opening in the wall to allow all this air to get through. And of course, we don't have big openings in walls anymore. We call them windows. So designer makes a decision of do we have, I don't know, 10 million one-inch square windows, it gives us the, the required amount of hole if we want, or do we have for larger windows? And then how do we actually manage the windows? Do we allow people to open them? How far do we allow them to open them? In our case, we've actually got the building that controls them. So the building thinks it's not enough, uh, too much carbon dioxide in it, uh, then it opens the windows. And on a day like this, I'm sure you'd be really thankful for that. But the building controls it. Some of the windows you can control by hand. Okay? So it's achieving this balance. But yeah, we want to be um, excellent. We've also got a safe opening windows. Okay? Natural ventilation is what safety people prefer. So yes, we agree with that side of it. But for the design team to get to it is sort of a, a big team effort on exactly what we will accept. Okay? And part of that, of course, as well, is who is actually in the university who's going to be exposed to these windows. I'm sure most of you here wouldn't throw yourselves out of a window. However, if I was three years old and in the library and bored stupid because mum is looking at the books, then I'm going to try opening the windows. And if the window's open, I'm going to climb up, climb up on it. So these are all the sort of aspects we have to build into this advice, if you like, on how to uh, control an issue raised by the design. Briam is just one of the examples, obviously. DDA is another big one. Uh, material sources, where does it all come from? Where do you reckon our materials come from? B and Q? China via Italy? South America? 
The last two are true. Okay? So part of the safety aspect is, well, if you've broken one of these, if, for example, you damage one of the tiles in the atrium on the floor there and it becomes a trip hazard, you've got to replace it. Where are you going to get one from? Ring up China, send us another one tiles there, mate. And 26 weeks later, it'll arrive. And the wrong size. Oh, the wrong size, of course, and the wrong colour as well, obviously. Okay, so the, the material sources, yes, it's a health and safety issue. How am I going to replace it? Uh, Non-university standard fixtures and fittings. Bloody nightmare for the maintenance people, this is. We've got 16 different types of light fitting in the atrium. So how many spares and things do you think they've got to hold if they want to keep the place lit? And all of them apparently on 16 weeks uh, lead time as well. So if your light goes off and they say, it'll be a while yet, mate, it's not their fault. Okay, they've got to wait for the light fitting. So again, design team, we're working through that currently. So we can't make it a bit more standard. So we can just pop out to B&Q and get a new one or wherever the nearest supplier is. And uh, non-standard fire doors. And we walked along the, the bottom corridor in Abercrombie. Right, anybody walk anywhere nowadays? <laughs> yeah, all good. <laughs> when you're walking along that corridor, you'll find the fire doors, they're quite heavy to open. Okay, because they're taller than normal. Uh, we can't find, well, the design team can't actually establish exactly why they're heavier than they should be. Okay, but they do actually suit the building. Aesthetically ideal. In terms of health and safety, they don't meet, meet part time of the building regs yet. But we'll keep going until they do. Okay. So again, think about what you're designing. Because we're now at the stage where we've got some installed. Then the NLTB, then big new building, we've got time just to simply change the spec on that. When we've got whatever it is, 18 or 20 installed at the moment, then we've got to do something about them. Okay, safety issue. This one, one of the bigger ones. Fire alarms, fire escape routes, consideration of those. When we've got the atrium, it's fully occupied, Abercrombie is fully occupied. But the final stage of things, when we hand over the main building sometime in the future, uh, when it all fits together, what we're doing now. Okay, you'll see at the, at the end of Aberc uh, the atrium there, you've got a fire escape route that then jinks under the stairs and out that door, or you have to go upstairs or whatever. So we need to consider all of those because we do have an interim stage. On this one, there's two main phases. On larger projects, you can have five or six main phases. And it's a major issue, making sure fire escape routes are maintained. Construction work is a very fluid operation. So you have to check almost daily to see if your fire escape route that you think is available is still actually available. And nobody's done anything silly with it. Okay. So that's a, ma a major one, that is. So when you're designing big stuff like this, think about how it works. Because obviously, the client here has paid a lot of money for this project. When the atrium is finished, he wants to occupy it. He ain't going to wait for a year until the rest of it is finished. As a designer, you should be aware of that. Okay, and make provision for it. <laughs> the final one. Cobbles. Does anybody know what cobbles are? I realise it's a word from my generation, not from yours. Okay. Yeah, but you'll see them outside the, uh, the cafe on the ground floor of the atrium, Down surrounding a tree. Okay. It looks very, very pretty. Uh, th again, it's another story of how things develop in a design process. Back in the beginning, these cobbles were smooth-faced, okay? nice, tightly fit. So it's a nice, smooth surface to, walk, surface to walk over. At some time in the design process, there was a value engineering exercise carried out who decided to change these extremely expensive cobbles into a rougher finish. Much cheaper, easier to lay, apparently. All that sort of idea. So it satisfied the, sort of the budgetary requirements by changing, if you like, the approved method of doing it. Having done that, and then put them in, we then look at it in terms of, well, can I get a wheelchair across it? Can I get a pushchair across it? some sort of sat trolley or whatever it is that people use in the university to distribute various bits and pieces. And the answer came back, very unlikely. So now we have to amend what we've done on that already, i.e. install a flat footpath uh, section of it, uh, using normal paving slabs, obviously. And then in the new part, the main building there, 
Um, I don't know exactly how much we've got in there. We've got loads and loads of these cobbles proposed. So now the design team's gone back, or having to go back rather, and actually redesign that area. So I've got smooth passageways for a person in a wheelchair, for a person in a pushchair. Again, just sim simple operation of the university, pushing trolleys of paper around the place. So those sort of things we've encountered during the design. Anything there you think is not my business? No, good luck. All right, contractor issues. Normally far more visible, far more easier to spot. Day to day, we may have all the plans in the world, all the safety advisors you like on the site. However, somebody with a lack of a moment's thought did this. Uh, that fire escape route there, you'd come out that door and they kindly put a skip in your way so you couldn't actually get very far. Okay? Day to day stuff. Somebody didn't think is all that comes down to. You can't legislate for it. What you can do is make sure that things are planned properly and there are enough supervisors, managers on the site to actually go around and check on this sort of stuff daily. Okay, so that happens. But there's not just that side of life. There's another side of life. Remember earlier I said you've got to read everything? Right, this is the building we wanted knocking down. Has anybody been here long enough to actually know that building? I uh, you can see it was sort of pretty ramshackle, uh, next door to I-Cells on the Western Access Road, down the bottom there. So we wanted that knocked down. Submit a method statement, tell us how you're going to do it, boys. Came in, beautiful. A good three or four kilograms of paperwork, you know, yeah, good method statement. And to actually sit down and read it. This is the demolition they were going to carry out, according to their method statement. Okay, so we, we lost it somewhere along the road, you know. Wooden building, no, no. I couldn't figure out where they parked the plane. <laughs> couldn't actually figure out how you landed it here in the first place. So that sort of thing as well. And those are laying over what, like most of the major contracting group, experts at health and safety apparently. Certainly experts at building stuff. Okay. But even then, you still need a third party to go through and check everything. Okay, so that's the other sort of things we come across. Okay. Any questions about that? No, yep, good. Out. Nice early lunch then, Tim. Right, I was asked if I'd put this on here for you, just to cheer you up, make you sort of happy and ready for your lunch. Okay, what happens when it goes wrong? If we really do screw up, what happens? Well, the thing called the Health and Safety Executive, HSE, can investigate and will investigate. And they can investigate everybody and everything. As I try to summarise there, every, everybody involved in whatever it was, okay, but also everybody affected by it. They have no sort of limits, if you like, on who they can investigate when it comes to an incident. They can certainly close the site, not a problem. We all get home early. They can prosecute organisations. Oxford Brooks University, Lang O'Rourke, any of the design team organisations. But unfortunately, they can also prosecute individuals. Okay. Now, how that works is, I'm not going to bore you with the following detail, but we allow ourselves under the Health and Safety at Work Act 1974 to investigate individuals. Okay. So, fair enough, it might have been Oxford Brooks University who were the main wrongdoer, if you like. However, we can still investigate further to find out the individual who's responsible for the decision or whatever it was that led to the problem. Okay, that's where this young man comes in. Okay, uh, certainly outside once you've sort of qualified and you're out in your own practices and doing that sort of stuff, remember that one. Okay, for example, it's not design engine, who are not only design engine, who can be prosecuted. It's design engine and anybody who works for them. Okay. That prosecution you can't insure against. Okay. It's illegal to insure against it. Insurance companies can't pay your fines or serve the time for you. Okay. So just bear that one in mind. Now the good news of course, if it's a serious offence, we can stick you in jail, we can hit you with an unlimited fine, or both. Okay, put you away for two years for health and safety offence. Uh, tacked on to that of course is corporate manslaughter. So if we actually managed to kill anybody here, which 
Judge Wood. Then, of course, we can actually prosecute the organisation in charge of it. Okay, for corporate manslaughter. We've had quite a few of those gone through now. Not on this job. Not on this job, no. no. Not that we know about. <laughs> Finally, although they're scary, they've got ultimate powers. There's very little they can't do. The HSA, the Health and Safety Executive, are a very good source of information on all matters health and safety, as you can imagine. You can download just about everything they do, everything they've, everything they've ever published. So very good for information, updating legislation. As I said, you can download most of their publications for free nowadays. Okay, so again, that's a good one to write down. Visit HSE site every now and then. Okay. And I think that's pretty much as much. As far as I'm going to go, I'm going to just going to give out any second now. Tim, anything to add to that? I think that was very good and concise from John. It's worked from our point of view to get the building where it's got to now by working closer together. I know a bit about building projects, but nothing as big as that. Up to this point, building one of the halls of residence of a 25 million pound project, I thought was big. This has been a whole new learning curve for me. So John's brought the expertise of working on that big project like this in, which has been invaluable to me. And I've given to John how the university operates on a day-to-day -day basis. And by bolting those two bits of information together and talking to the contractors, we've managed to get as far as we have with as little disruption and no serious health and safety issues to date. Yep. Okay, so far.